Alright, today is Sunday the 7th of July. This is a recap for the stock market activities for the week that was and an outlook for the week to come. And folks, I got a good one for you tonight. And greetings from a heat record chattering the city of lights, Las Vegas. Oh, it is hot, hot, hot. And I know what you're gonna say, hey Maverick, you really thought you're gonna garden in Las Vegas. Good luck with that. Actually, my garden is doing pretty good right now. Although today was kind of rough, but uh, it's all figured out right now. I'll show you some pictures in a later video. But folks, I hope you got a great uh, holiday weekend. Uh, you enjoyed the 4th of July without doing anything stupid, such as uh, this poor bastard who uh, shot fireworks out of his head and uh, yeah, ended up being dead. You know what else is dead? It's the Biden presidential campaign, along with perhaps the rally in Bitcoin, the rally in the stock market, and the hopes of interest rate cuts. We'll talk about that and a lot more in this video, so buckle up. Because in the last few weeks, we got a bunch of holidays, short and trading weeks with low volume. The traders are not here. The path of least resistance is higher. But this week onward, we'll be back in business, baby. We'll be busy, busy, busy. And the reason is action is about to heat up in a big way. And let's begin with the political risk. Of course, people ask, what do we care about the politics, Maverick? What do we care about the elections? All of that doesn't matter at the end of the day. It doesn't matter if we have a Democrat or a Republican. They're all going to work uh, for the benefit of the stock market and the oligarchy. And there's truth to that, of course. Uh, pretty much, it doesn't matter which president it is, uh, Republican, Democrat. At the end of the day, they work out to benefit the stock market. But of course, we see that more often than not, the bigger crashes happen under Republican presidents. We got Nixon in the 70s. We got W in uh, 2008, 2009. We got some bad uh, years under Democrats, uh, Joey B, of course, in 22. But the big crashes happen under Republicans. So if the odds right now say that the Donald is about to become president again, the odds put it that if there was a crash, it will probably happen under his watch. Which again, do you really want to become president right now? I mean, if you look at the outlook for the economy with interest rates and inflation and the weakness that we're beginning to see in many sectors of the economy, do you really want to be president right now and assume the responsibility for something that you really don't have a lot of control over? When we talk about the political risk, folks, I mean, you see what's going on in the elections that we got so far in Europe. We're changing political parties. And of course, every election is unique. Each country and each nation has uh, their own problems to deal with and their own political circumstances. But at the end of the day, folks, it doesn't matter if we're talking about the US or Japan or Europe or the Middle East or whatever. At the end of the day, the number one issue remains globally, worldwide, universally. Even the Martians care about it. Economic well-being. And if you're not feeling so hot so about the economy, be it inflation, be it your wages not catching up, be it uh, job security, housing and affordability, folks have the tendency of blaming whoever is in power right now. Even though we talked about this numerous times in this program, that inflation is a monetary phenomenon. The central bank's cabal is responsible for the inflation problem, not the ruling governments, but of course the population will blame whoever is in charge. Case in point, of course, South America. You got Brazil under inflation. You got a, uh, let's say, capitalist government under Bolsonaro. They're blamed. And now we have more socialist government under Lula. The same thing happened in Colombia, in Chile. But the opposite took place in Argentina where you have record high inflation under a socialist slash liberal government. So now they change it into a conservative slash capitalist government. And the same thing happened in the UK over the weekend. Conservative party was ruling the UK under record high inflation, food prices out of control, uh, home affordability, forget about it. So of course the blame goes uh, to the conservative party and now we have the replacement in the Labour Party. But within Europe, of course, we have the rise of the nationalists slash the right wing movements also gaining some traction in these elections. The Reform UK party also gained some traction. The biggest loser, of course, is the Conservative Party. And uh, this weak, pathetic leader was an embarrassment to the United Kingdom, in my opinion, at least. Richie Sunak. The guy's richer than the king. He's supposed to be an oligarch, but he was a weak cuck. And everybody saw it. And unfortunately, that's the same thing with Macron and France, with uh, the Chancellor of Germany. Nobody respects these countries at all. They got clowns as leaders, and they're all following the global cabal, aka the global oligarchy. And the same is happening here in the United States. 
Nobody looks at the leadership that we have right now without immense concern about the status of the uh, most powerful country in the world. It's being led by somebody who cannot even remember his own name. But anyways, we've seen also the political instability going on in Europe, in uh, France. Even though these elections came out, I would say the results are right now favorable a little bit, at least the stock market, because we have no consensus. Nobody got the majority to have a one-way street, as we've seen the Labour Party in the UK. So the market will look at this as, okay, the government is split, which means at the end of the day, nobody's going to have a one-way street, which will be good for the market. Needless to say, the so-called right wing in France gained a lot of traction in this election. And of course, they say it's uh, confidence in Zelensky and Ukraine is dropping in Europe. And uh, Europe is now warming up for Putin. Well, gee, why is that happening? Because maybe after years of the stupid war, inflation, waste of money, billions and billions of dollars, the population of these countries is not really seeing any benefit or any point of the endless wars led, of course, by the United States. And what I see in Europe for now, of course, they say the right wing as in anti-immigrant, uh, maybe uh, they call it pro-Russia, whether that's true or not. But soon enough, it's going to be anti-United States. Because a lot of these countries will look around and say, wait a minute, why are we damaging our own national interest, say Germany, uh, just to please the U.S.? Why can't we just uh, have cheap gas from Russia? The Netherlands will look around and say, why do we have to restrict selling chips to China? We can make money with a large trading partner just to please the United States. So again, folks, we're going to lose more and more influence around the world and even within the alliances in Europe. But when we talk about the elections, once again, even in Iran, we have a change in the political leaning of the leadership of the country. Now we have a reformist, I mean, reformist wink wink, because he's not really calling the shots. But again, it's the voice of the population saying, you know what, we, we got... Insane inflation going on right now. And who are we going to blame? Whatever party, whatever political leaning that was in charge. Now we're going to go with the opposite. So we see it all over the place. And the question now becomes, are we about to see this happening here in the United States? Democrats in charge, inflation out of control. The economy is not doing pretty good, despite the propaganda and the gaslighting that we keep getting all the time. The odds, ladies and gentlemen, say that we're going to change parties, that the opposition will take charge comes November. But what increases the odds of the opposition taking over and the Democrats losing is the fact that the Joey B campaign is collapsing. And the Joey B campaign is running out of time to exit amicably. More than this hawk to a chick running out of her 15 minutes of fame. Tick tock, baby. About seven minutes left now. Either you get the OnlyFans out or it's over. Then you look back uh, with great regret and sorrow at uh, a, a, a huge missed opportunity. What do you give a shit anyways? You start the OnlyFans, you charge $100 a month. Demand is way too high. You guys want it? Okay, we'll charge you. And the donkeys will pay, of course. You get at least 20000 of them paying 100 bucks a month. That's two mil right in the bank. Then things start start to slow down, maybe you'll keep 20%, 15%, you reduce the price to 25%, and even with that, you're still going to make more than any job would pay. But again, she says, oh, I just do funny jokes. Honey, let me just give you a hint here. Most guys watching you in mute, they're not really interested in the jokes. But back to Joey B, because he's running out of time. <laughs> He can't save himself by uh, starting an OnlyFans account. Nobody's into a uh, mummy porn. But anyways, this week will be an important week. Because we talked about the rumor and the little birdie that told us that uh, it's going to happen this week. I mean, when you have the mainstream media turning against you, there is no way you're going to survive it here. And we know who rules the media. It's the oligarchy. And the oligarchy is saying through the media, hey, Joey, time is up. You got Insider, which is a publication for the uh, intelligence apparatus of Uranus, CIA, NSA, that kind of stuff. And they're spilling the beans, saying that he struggles to function after 4 p.m. So again, if you're in Europe, and you're worried about Russia shooting nuclear bombs on you, and the White House getting the 2 a.m. call that, hey, Russia is now shooting nuclear bombs. You think this president is going to wake up to begin with, let alone deal with it? And again, from Insider, they say 11 a.m., Joey B. starts his day, and then an hour later takes an afternoon nap. It's too much for him to handle. They say that his wife keeps reminding him of names, because he keeps forgetting about these names. This week, he came out, and he identified as a black woman saying that he's the first black woman to serve with a black president, Jack. Even the New York Times now say that Biden lapses are said to be increasingly common and worrisome. Slate, another publication that's supposed to be allied to the president, saying no offense, but Jill Biden should not be anywhere 
near the decision about whether Biden drops out. A Daily Beast, another intelligence publication, says Obama privately goes shaky after offering to prop up Biden. Even CNN says that it's a post-debate crisis, now evolving into a genuine threat to his re-election bid. So again, the media is now throwing Joey B under the bus. There is a revolt within the mainstream media, and that's how you know it's over. If that was not enough, the donors... You know, your beloved uh, stacks that you keep uh, buying in the market and making these oligarchs richer and richer every day. And of course, they use the money to corrupt your politics and destroy your lives. Netflix CEO now says that Joey B's toast is done. He's going to step aside so we can beat the orange man. The Disney family now says won't support the Democratic Party until Joey B drops out. Another propaganda tool owned by Jeff Bezos, Van Johns, he says that Democrats discussing how to replace Biden, not whether. Even Bill Maher, another tool for the regime, he says, uh, why I want an open convention. Nate Silver, pollster, he also says that uh, he's incoherent and he's supposed to drop out, resign. Not just drop out, but resign. House Democrats today said, gotta exit, it's over, get the hell out. So folks, the writing is in the wall. We have a big change coming this week. And uh, the problem here is not whether it's going to be a Democrat or Republican. The problem is going to be, A, the uncertainty. Because the market is uncertain and not really confident about uh, Kamala. And the market, of course, has questions about a second-term presidency of Trump. The tariffs, the unpredictable nature of the policy. And of course, the other scenario is what if we have sort of a civil war where Joey B and his allies, whoever is remaining right now, go against the rest of the oligarchy who are revolting against Biden at this point. I mean, everybody says he should get out. The only people we know of who say that he should stay is Joey B himself, who says, no one is pushing me out, Jack. And of course, Dr. Fooch, who says that Joey B is on fire and he should be president again. Is healthier than ever before. And again, the odds rising for Kamala that she's going to be the replacement, at least for now. Uh, but if you look at the Telegraph here, this is um, a publication on behalf of the uh, British intelligence, or shall we say lack of intelligence. They say that President Kamala would be a disaster for the world. So here we go, folks. We're about to head into political uncertainty. We're removed from, okay, now the market and the economy got two clear choices. Either it's going to be a Democrat or a Republican. We're just going to change the colors, but the policy will stay the same. Serving the stock market, serving the rich and the ruling class. We're moving away from that to uncertainty. To what's going to happen now? Is it going to be Kamala? Is it going to be an open convention? Is it going to be a revolt? Is it going to be uh, Joey B fighting back? Is it going to be Trump slipping on a ban appeal and dying all of a sudden? The guy's, what, almost 80? You can't take anything for certain. So, folks, all of you who keep saying that the politics doesn't matter and the market doesn't care about the politics or who's going to win the elections or not, you're about to see that it does matter. But, of course, a lot of the participants in the market today are still in the diapers. They all joined after 2020. Uh, they don't even remember 2016 or other years of political uncertainty and volatility. Now, I want to segue to the macro discussion tonight because we have the jobs report that we got on Friday. It was the most important piece of macro data that we got last week. It was a nothing burger week, a low volume holiday week, but this was the most important report. And I want to clarify something about it because the media is misrepresenting the data. Those who want, in the media, of course, those who want a stronger jobs number to fluff up uh, the administration or the Democratic Party, whatever interest that they got. They're concentrating on the headline number that the economy created 206,000 jobs. The economy is still on fire, baby. And then you have the other cohort in the media who are just begging for rate cuts to fluff up uh, the real estate market and the equities market and keep the same uh, filth going on. The Fed apologists, I uh, think uh, Steve Leisman, those kind of people. And of course, they look at the report as, oh, but the jobs number is actually weak. And that means that rate cuts are coming sooner than later. Let's look at the facts here. 206,000 jobs, but the unemployment rate rises to 4.1%. You can see the trend here. We have bottomed in 23, and now we're moving higher. And of course, this is not a surprise to anybody, specifically a viewer of this channel. You know that the unemployment rate will rise higher. It's inevitable. The Fed says it's going to be an amicable 4.2, but of course, in reality, it will become horrifically more than that.
because this time around, not only you have the prospects of a recession and a crash, but you also have the prospects of AI replacing a lot of jobs. And that's going to happen during the recession, by the way. So unlike the recovery in the aftermath of the great financial crisis, when the Fed juiced up uh, the economy and the market with trillions of dollars, we've seen companies rehiring people. It took a little time, but we've recovered. I mean, it took about, let's say, 10 years or so to get back to full employment. This time around, it's going to be harder because a lot of these jobs will be replaced by AI. And this is why I say this is the last one. We're never going to see these low rates of unemployment again. Once we see the explosion, it's going to come down and settle, but it's going to settle at a higher unemployment level, historically speaking. We might not even see below 5% again. That brings the discussion of universal basic income and all of that, but this is not the topic of tonight's video. At the same time, wage inflation is going down 3.9% year on year. Of course, the Fed apologists would say that this is a, an indication or a signal for the Fed to begin cutting rates because inflation 3.9 wages means that the Fed is on track to defeat inflation. We'll show you the facts in a minute, but the devil is always in the details, of course, when you look at the sector by sector creation of jobs. It mostly came from education and health, not really education. I don't know why they lump both of them together, but it's healthcare. And the reason is we have a booming uh, elderly population that needs a lot of care. And of course, anybody who's involved in the healthcare business, as I do, in uh, cities where folks moved into, talk about Idaho, talk about Las Vegas, talk about Phoenix, talk about Austin. All of these places are facing shortages of healthcare workers, whether we're talking about doctors, nurses, social workers. And therefore, we see the need of hiring keeps going and wages in this sector also keeps going higher. But we also see creation of jobs coming from government. And we know that the creation of jobs by the government will be limited with the insane budget deficit that we have. But for now, it's an election year and the government wants to cook the data. So they keep creating jobs themselves, printing jobs, really. Whether these jobs are real or fake, they can revise them down later. But nobody's paying attention, of course. Needless to say, when you have an economy where the majority of jobs are created by healthcare, because we have aging population and government, this is not really a healthy economy as we see right here. But this is month on month. If we look at the annual rate of jobs creation or lack thereof, you will see that we have, once again, healthcare at number one, government at number two. Healthcare, that's going to remain hot because of the dynamics of the aging population. It will get hit in a recession, of course, as any other sector, but the need will still be there. Government, of course, this is not sustainable because of the huge budget deficit that we got. Then we have leisure and hospitality. We'll get back to that in a minute, but we have construction. Now, construction is gone. The construction boom in America is over, and we're heading into a massive recession here. Housing starts, this is the latest piece of data that we got, falls to four year low. Higher interest rates sticking for longer, making it harder to get loans for construction. We have a huge oversupply of apartments coming into the market and that's going to cause another bomb in the economy. We got a lot of construction data in the last couple of weeks, all of them pointing out that we have probably hit the peak in the construction mania and construction jobs and we're trending downward from this point on. We go back to leisure and hospitality because if you're looking at job creation between healthcare government and leisure and hospitality, it is clear which one is indicative of an actual strong economy or not. It's leisure and hospitality. The problem is with higher interest rates, dwindling savings among consumers, and inflation sticking as it is at a higher rate, still pricing going higher. The spending reserves and ability by the consumer will cause a slowdown in travel and leisure, which will cause job losses to come. I mean, this was a really low number for leisure and hospitality. 7,000 jobs, that's it. What is the next step? Going negative? I think it is. You look at the poll here from McKinsey asking the consumer about expected spending per category over the next three months compared to the usual. And pay attention now, because when we talk about stagflation, folks, I'm not pulling that out of my ass. There's hardcore data supporting the fact that we are in stagflation right now. And the stagflation problem will be exacerbated in the next few months in this economy. Consumers say that they're going to spend more on gasoline in the next three months. There's a net increase of 13 points over last year. Then when we see the categories they're cutting spending on, how about international flights down 10 points, domestic flights down 3 points, cruises down 15 points, entertainment away from home down 5 points, and you got meals at quick service restaurants for takeout, etc. Down 4 points. Then you look at hotel, resort stays down 8 points over last quarter. 
So it's just a matter of time before we lose jobs in leisure and hospitality, because we also talked about how wages are way too high in that sector. And the moment you see a slowdown, all of these companies are going to respond by slashing headcount. Okay, so what's left in this economy? More healthcare jobs? More government printing of jobs? And now what you're going to say, we go back to the Fed apologists, you'll say, okay, but this slowdown in the economy, Maverick, means that the Federal Reserve would now cut rates and fluff the economy back up. Just like uh, from the Wall Street Journal, you got Nick Timaros. Now, we talked about James McIntosh. When you read his articles, you have to be in the toilet taking a shit because it's going to help your bowels move. But the other reason is his articles have more substance or so it takes a little more time to read. Nick Timaros' articles don't take a lot because there's no substance at all. So a quick trip to piss at the urinals will do the job. You just read the article right away. It'll help you piss even more because you want to piss on the article. There's no substance. There's no intelligence at all. And here he says case for September rate cut builds after slower jobs data. And my question to Nick and everybody else is, okay, so you're spotting signs of a slowdown in the economy and you're suggesting that the Fed should cut rates because of that. I don't think that the Fed, even the Fed, I don't think Mr. Powell, of course, he plays dumb all the time, but even Powell knows that this is not the perimeter to cut rates. The slowdown in the economy will happen because inflation been going on for years and rates are way too high for at least certain sectors in the economy. The real perimeter to look at is how easy it is to reinflate commodities if we have rate cuts. And the quick answer is it is easier to reinflate commodities than reinflating Zac Efron's jaw. Why do we say that? Because we already have a stagflationary problem in the economy. If you're going to cut rates to fix the stag, you're accelerating the inflation part, which of course, Mr. Powell again plays dumb, says I don't see the stag or the inflation. But anybody knows that two leading indicators for the national economy, the state of California and the city of Las Vegas, whatever happens here will spread into the economy later on. If you look at the Vegas economy, unemployment rate in Nevada, 5% in the month of April now went a lot higher, but this is way above the national average. Here's your stag about deflation. When we look at the CPI for the Western region in the country, you can see that we're higher in all items, in food, definitely in energy. If you look at California, the city of Los Angeles, most populous in the state, the unemployment rate in the state of California is 4.8% in the month of April, way above the national average. Of course, we all know that the state of California got caught cooking the jobs data, showing us a rosier picture than reality. In the city of Los Angeles, the unemployment rate in the month of April, 4.6, now of course way above 5%. How about the CPI though? 3.9 in the month of April, 3.3 and 6.4 in energy, way above the national average. We talk about whether it's easy to reinflate commodities or not. Well, if commodities were getting hammered throughout the year, then sure, you got the green light to uh, cut rates because if they reinflate, they're not going to cause an inflation problem. There'll be a normalization process instead, sort of a recovery process in commodities. But this is not what we see. What we see is commodities been rallying for the most part. So you look at the year-to-date performances in energy commodities. Brent is up over 20%. Likewise, the WTI up about 20%. The gasoline are bob up a little over 10%. The only laggard is natural gas, down about 25%, but it is coming back. It rallied off the bottom recently. If you look at the year-to-date performances in softs, cocoa up uh, over 184%. OJ up over 37%, coffee up over 25%. You only got cotton down about 13 to 14% and lumber down a little over 23%. And this is again, evidence of stagflation, lumber, housing, construction. It is showing you that we have a huge slowdown in uh, building new homes and construction, but we have other softs moving higher in price. We look at the year to date performances in metals, gold up, silver up, copper up, we only have palladium in the red, but that's also been rallying off the bottom recently. If you look at meats, whether we're looking at live cattle, feeder cattle, that's moving higher year to date. Now, if we look at grains, those are going down year to date. If we're looking at soybeans, wheat, corn, oats, but here's the problem. We talked about this in the last weekend's show, which came out Monday. We charted some, uh, grains commodities and we told you that we might see rallies and indeed if you look at the one week performances soybean oil up almost 13 percent canola wheat soybean meal soybeans all up big for the week only laggard is rough rice down about five percent so again what do you think is going to happen if the fed begins cutting rates do you think uh, that the inflation that we see in commodities will subside and go down instead or will the devaluation of the dollar push commodities inflation higher 
And then the Fed has to reverse and flip flop and do rate hikes again. And when that happens, it's the same story as we've seen back in 07, 08, which led to the crash. The outlook for now, as we see wages going down, but inflation sticking and the possibility, of course, in the next CPI, which we're getting this week with energy going back up because of the geopolitical tensions, because of the devaluation of currencies, the probability is we will see a flip in this picture that you see right here, where we've seen since the year 23 wages outpacing the rate of inflation, at least on paper. We know in reality it's not, but on paper, and that was good for the stock market. But if you see wages dipping below the rate of inflation, oops, we're back again to the same dynamic that we got in 22, and you'll see damage in the economy. You will see damage definitely in the equities market. And speaking of, let's segue to the market segment of this program. And we begin with some signs. Of course, we'll talk about the, the outlook for the week because that's going to be more interesting. But another sign that we have a problem in this market, there is no contrary opinion anymore. Anybody who has any counter opinion, as in, hey, this is a replica of 2000, the dot-com bubble, and we're heading in a bad outcome, all of these voices disappeared and flip-flop, and the remaining ones, of course, they got axed and they lost their jobs. The latest one being uh, J.P. Morgan's Marco Kalanovic. The guy was a star at J.P. Morgan because he made these outlandish, bullish predictions throughout the year. A lot of them came true, specifically in the year 2020 amidst the pandemic. He remained bullish, I would say hyper-bullish, throughout the bear market in 22. Big mistake but then flip-flop to becoming a bear as the Fed initiated a program to rescue the banks and pump more liquidity into the system in 23. And rumor has it, J.P. Morgan gave Marco Kalanovich last week to capitulate and to raise the S&P target to 5,800. Now look, this stupid game of giving targets is, is useless. It doesn't give us investors any value whatsoever. It's a clown game that the Wall Streeters play within themselves. If you're going to play that game, then give me the target in the beginning of the year. No upgrades, no adjustments, no downgrades, nothing. But they give you a target and then they keep upping the target, just chasing the market. So what is the point behind any of that? But of course, Kalanovich did not capitulate and he came out. I mean, he had the lowest outlook in the street that the S&P will actually crash down and close the year in or around 4,200. JP Morgan was embarrassed by that. Everybody's upping the targets to 6,000 now. And Kalanovich did not capitulate. He actually doubled down. He said S&P will plummet by 23% by year end. That was the camel that broke the straw at JP Morgan. They said, okay, you know what? You're gone. It's over. And the man lost his job. And now everybody, no exception, everybody on the street is hyper bullish, not just bullish, but hyper bullish. And to me, that's a major warning sign. At the end, Kalanovich might be right because here's Forbes and they say in Wall Street, bearish investors are out of favor. But there is mounting evidence that they are right about the stock market outlook. And again, folks, if this is not your first rodeo and you've seen market ups and downs, bubbles, inflation episodes before, you know how this is going to end. And this is the biggest one of them all. The outlook will be right, and Kalanovich will be right. Question is, after how many record highs? The answer should be, I don't really care. The higher it goes, the bigger the crash. But the problem is when you give a target in this clown game, now you're abided by that target by year end. And there are different bears, at least used to be different bears. You have uh, folks like Kalanovich, whose entire bearish thesis is earnings, or earnings are going to go down. I don't subscribe to that because I think that earnings is a byproduct of the monetary policy and the macroeconomic environment. So if you have a bearish thesis based on earnings, that's going to materialize after the fact. It'll be obvious to everybody. But the bearish thesis that I got, for example, is based on the monetary policy and the nature of inflation. It's based on the icy height phenomenon, on the stagflation phenomenon, that to rescue one side, you have to fuel the other part. To eliminate the stag, you need to bring inflation back. You bring inflation back, you have to raise rates, and now the economy is yo-yoing back and forth, there's a lot of damage, and then it collapses on its own weight. And again, everybody thinks that, yeah, we know it's a bubble, but we're going to time it pretty good. That's the same thing they said back in 99. I mean, if you remember the uh, internet cafes back in the day, they became trading rooms. You get in before the market opens. We get into the Yahoo chat rooms and then uh, we begin trading and everybody was making money. But we'll stop once in a while and say, listen, is, is this really real? Because these shitty companies have no earnings, no revenue. And even the ones that got revenue and earnings, the valuation's out of whack. Everybody said, yeah, we know that. But for now, you play the game that you got, and when uh, it goes down, we'll get out. Well, show me how many millionaires and billionaires from regular folks 
who maintained their gains when the dot-com bubble bursted. Not a lot. Not even close. Not even 1%. Why? Because it is the same psychological pitfalls that throughout the bubble, every dip, every scare episode was fixed right away. And when you get the one that cracks the bubble, nobody really sees it coming. And even after it happens, it is dismissed as, okay, this is going to be another dip that will be bought. And here we go again. Uh, stay the course, hold your horses, everything is fine. And then they don't get out until it's way too late. And I don't think that we've learned anything between then and now. It's the same behavior. It's even more dangerous because they spoiled you big time, way bigger than the dot-com bubble in this episode. But anyhow, listen, we can talk about this and the outlook for the economy and the market in details in a later video. But what we have this week for now, because we have still investing opportunities, trading opportunities, and you would say, but Maverick, aren't you repeating the same mistakes from the dot-com here? I would say this. Remember that scene from the great movie in the 90s, Heat, Pacino, De Niro, when De Niro says, you got 30 seconds flat when you feel the heat around the corner, you have no commitments, you just walk out. Question for any investor right now in this bubble right here. If you feel the heat around the corner and you're getting all of this macro data worsening in the housing market and construction, in the jobs report, if you feel that heat around the corner coming, can you walk out? with no commitment at all? Before you answer that question, I think it comes with the territory. Since the VIX has reached the year-to-date low, isn't it the time to hedge portfolios? Because put options, aka the insurance policies, are cheapest they've ever been. How many investors do you think right now, as we speak, weathering their portfolios for, let's say, a 5% drop in the market? And if it gets worse than that, then the insurance policy still holds. How many asset managers you think taking the opportunity right now to weather portfolios for their clients? Not many, because the psychological pitfall again, that there is no need for hedging. So again, when that heat comes around the corner, they're not going to be able to walk out. But in any case, folks, let's talk about this week's trading dynamics. If we look at the SPY, we've been consolidating holiday weeks for a while now, just wasting time. But in the last trading days, it appears that we have an energy release out of this consolidation range. And the energy release is happening to the upside. So we have what is called a breakout. These skeptics, of course, would say that this happened under a holiday low volume trading week, so it's easier to pump the market higher. This is misleading. We'll be back within the consolidation range this upcoming week. I would say, let's look at the components of the S&P 500 one by one based on the weight and then make a judgment. So we're going to look at the XLK. This is the technology ETF, the big caps. We're going to look at the individual names, Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Meta, Amazon. We're going to look at the IGV software because the entirety of the software sector is a heavy weight in the SPY. Now we can argue about Eli Lilly. I think that's a different dynamic, but Eli Lilly is also a huge component of the S&P, but we're going to pass on that for now. We're going to look at JP Morgan, aka the financial sector, because together it is also a big component of the S&P. And then of course, the biggest one of them all, NVIDIA. Then we're gonna look at the momentum indicators, at least this week, momentum showed up in Tesla and before that was in Bitcoin. So we wanna look at the momentum indicators and how they look right now, and then make a judgment on what we see. We begin with the XLK, daily chart. What do we see here? Almost caught a rebound off the 20 days moving average. Now we're challenging the highs and we closed above the highs, 232.59. That is considered a bullish breakout. You're making higher highs. You're looking at the weekly chart for the XLK. Again, since we're making higher highs and we look at the momentum indicators, sure, they're overextended for now, but not anything out of the ordinary. So are we looking at an ABC breakout? It certainly looks like it right now. If you look at the individual components, we begin with Apple. That's already under an ABC breakout. Last week, we talked about the 220 calls. We're already above that. We're closing at 225, now 230. So perhaps Apple is leading the XLK into the ABC break. And watch Apple as a leading indicator because it is overbought in the daily. If it begins to reverse, that could be a warning sign that, okay, out of gas, now we're going to look for something different. Of course, we're going to track this throughout the week, component by component. Now, you look at Microsoft and see the same look as we're seeing in the S&P. And these, all of them, been leading indicators for the breakout. Microsoft been consolidating for weeks since last year. And all of this energy is being released to the upside right now. You look at the weekly momentum, still bullish, still breaking out to the upside. We're not seeing any sign of a problem, at least in this chart right here. You see the same look on the daily chart for Google. Consolidation for a little while. Now the energy is being released to the upside. Momentum indicators also pointing out 
for a bullish breakout. Sure, they're getting a little overextended, and that's the concern that we have in all of them. You look at Meta, it's the same thing, stall at the resistance now closing above this is the weekly chart and you can see the momentum whether you look at the rsi or the macd changing from bearish consolidation to bullish breakout you look at amazon daily chart so we're flipping from weekly to daily from chart to chart just to show you that all of them are aligning in one way at least in the xlk amazon energy release out of consolidation now in a bull flag consolidating at 200 we're not seeing any sign of reversal right now so you gotta assume that this is bullish the igv if you watched the chart to watch video that we gave to the members about a week and a half ago we talked about a breakout coming for the igv if we pass the resistance line and then we gave you target one two three we have reached all of them little exhausted, little overbought, but then you look at the weekly chart for the IGV software, you can argue it's a cup and handle. We can argue that in the MACD indicator, we're shifting from bearish to bullish, and we're making higher highs, at least for now. What about JP Morgan, aka the XLF? Because JP Morgan is the biggest weight in the XLF financials. We have earnings coming out from JP Morgan this Friday. This one is uncertain because the momentum is changing into bearish. But we still have consolidation, no breakout yet. Maybe the XLF is waiting for the earnings report to come out before it breaks out as we've seen in Microsoft and Google and Meta. So for now, we're just gonna keep a question mark uncertain. We'll leave it as it is. Now, the biggest component of the S&P is NVIDIA. And NVIDIA showed signs of life before the 4th of July holiday via gamma squeeze it was easier to do under low volume, but it died right away on Friday. And for now, the pattern remains means bearish head and shoulder formation. So this one is showing a different look than Google, Meta, Microsoft, the IGV. And the reason is if you look at the options market for NVIDIA, if we look at the flow from Friday, they're closing a lot of calls. Deep in the money calls, out of the money calls, they're closing them. And the biggest one on Friday's session was about $8 million for the 79 calls. Expiration date, some in July 5th, meaning Friday there was, and July 12th meaning this upcoming Friday. They closed them about $8 million worth. So this feedback tells the market maker, take it easy, we're booking our profits here, so there is no pressure to move the stock higher anymore. Now the market maker has to look at the buy flow. If we look at the buy out of the money, we see huge contracts again. So you see the 131, 132 calls, about $8 million spent on those. But again, a lot of them expired worthless on Friday. And the rest of the bets, way out of the money at the 135 132 shorter expiration dates so for now they're not having a lot of influence in the market maker to push the tape higher but keep an eye if the flow comes out as buying out of the money calls again in the video and we're not seeing a lot of closing of the calls when you look at the sell flow, but we're actually seeing closing of the puts in the sell flow, then NVIDIA can come back. And if NVIDIA comes back, it will push the S&P higher, no doubt. But for now, XLK bullish, Apple looks bullish, Microsoft, Google, Meta, Amazon, IGV all look bullish. If that changes, we're going to update you throughout the week. JP Morgan Chase XLF remains uncertain. We'll see what happens this Friday. NVIDIA is looking bearish. And of course, what led the rally is NVIDIA. Folks would say what leads the drop is NVIDIA. We'll see about that, but let's look at the momentum indicators, Tesla and Bitcoin. Tesla, big week, huge breakout. We talked about this, that we have energy consolidation since the month of May. And that's going to be released one way or the other. The implied volatility is going to drop big time. Once they break, if they take 180 decisively for the week, then you want to follow the upside break. If they take 168 and a half, then you want to follow a downside break. We got a break above 180. We got a tension range of consolidation. We broke above that and then came bull flag after bull flag after bull flag. It was easy to pump Tesla higher because of the short and holiday week and a lot of flows of buying calls out of the money. The problem that I see in the chart right now, it is way overbought. And if we're gonna look for a pullback, let's use uh, Fibonacci and we zoom out a little bit. You don't wanna go too crazy on a pullback trade right now, because if you go to 200, that might happen, but after earnings coming out later this month. But for now, the number one target for a pullback, I would say 225, no more than that. If we're gonna play the put options, the call options game, of course, is over. And uh, this is probably what would lead the stock in a pullback. The reason is if you look at the IV rank, Tesla at 100%, meaning that the call options right now more expensive than they've been in a year time frame. Meaning that if you're buying them right now, you're giving your money to the market maker. Easy money. NVIDIA, on the other hand, 43, 44%. So I would say that there is possibility that NVIDIA might come back. But Tesla, definitely coming really close for a pullback. And if you look at the flows on Friday, they're booking profits on a lot of these calls that they bought for June, July's expiration, millions and millions of dollars. And then you look at the out of the money 
calls buying. We're seeing some of the 260 calls. But again, if the market maker doesn't see millions and millions of dollars being bought out of the money and closing of the puts, they're not going to move the tape higher. In all likelihood, they're moving down. Then we'll look at the other momentum indicator, Bitcoin. Over $170 billion wiped off the cryptocurrencies market. They say because of Mt. Gox. All this is bullshit. I think it's because of the technicals, really. And once you see the, uh, the scammers on Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it, doesn't matter to me. The crypto pumpers, they come out with the same post. They're no different than the government propaganda and the mainstream media, where they repeat the lines verbatim. All of them make the same post over and over and over again. Before the drop in Bitcoin, they all came up with this narrative right here. That the price of Bitcoin tracks the Fed's liquidity and Fed liquidity is about to go higher. That's how you know that Bitcoin is actually going down and they want somebody to hold the bag. Anyhow, fast forward. Here's the weekly chart for Bitcoin. Can we say Maverick top? Sure. Uh, can we find support at the 50 weeks moving average at around, let's say, 48 thousand could be but for now we lost a lot of ground one of the highest momentum plays in the market so we'll look at the momentum indicators tesla bearish because it is overheated and bitcoin also bearish now if you begin to see that apple flipping to bearish if you begin to see that the igv these are the most likely ones to flip first apple and igv then maybe amazon if you begin to see that nvidia stays bearish and tesla indeed's pulled back and bitcoin stays bearish and of course we watch the vix it begins to break out and take out resistance lines then the picture will become clear that we have the second correction of the year coming we'll take it one step at a time for now folks since we looked at the charts and we looked at the options flow we're going to skip to the conclusion of this video what do we have on the economic calendar this week beginning tomorrow july 8 monday we have consumer credit so and nothing burger kind of day. But then Tuesday, July 9th, we have the NFIB Small Business Optimism Index. We have Chairman Powell testimony at the Senate. The following day, Wednesday, July 10th, we have Powell again in the House. Hopefully, your beloved politicians will ask questions about stagflation and what will happen to the prospects of inflation if he indeed cut rates at this point. We also have the wholesale inventories on Wednesday. Comes July 11th. Now we're back in business. We got the CPI. We got initial jobless claims. And then we have two interesting Fed zombies from Atlanta, Bostic, and from San Luis, Alberto Mozalim. We'll see what they say about the CPI and the outlook, but Friday, July 12th, we get the PPI. And of course, the preliminary reading of consumer sentiment. And comes with it, of course, inflation expectations. Interesting week ahead from the political point of view. What's going to happen to the Biden campaign? What's going to happen to Bitcoin now that it's beginning to fall apart? What's going to happen in NVIDIA? Will it come back or will it continue to dive down and play the head and shoulder pattern? What happens to the recent momentum breaks in the technology cohort and the big caps? Will we see the breakout continue to play out or will the breakout hit the overbought conditions and begin to reverse? And of course, what's going to happen with JP Morgan's earnings, banking earnings coming out beginning this Friday. Any warnings from Jamie Demon? All of these will move the market and the action will be interesting. So we'll be more active. The time for uh, break time and napping and sleeping and taking time off. That's over now. We're back in business, baby. But with that, folks, let's wrap the show right here. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. This is all I got for you for tonight. If you liked the video, press the like button, subscribe to the channel, leave us a nice comment, join us as a member. But folks, this is all I got for you for tonight. Thank you for listening once again. Thank you for watching and I will talk to you again tomorrow. Good night. Remember Jimmy McElwain on the yard used to say, you want to be making moves on the street, have no attachments, allow nothing to be in your life that you cannot walk out on in 30 seconds flat if you spot the heat around the corner. Remember that?